So I'm going to start by this comment, really. I'm, I wonder how many famous female artists you can name. And I mean female painters who have ever lived. And I suspect you'd be pushed to come up with more than a handful. I know I certainly was. There are many, of course, but you have to Google them to find out who they are. I can think of Beth Morisot, the Impressionist, Frida Kahlo, Louisa Lebrun, Maria, uh, sorry, Mary Cassatt, and then our own Vanessa Bell. But then uh, off the top of my head, I would really be struggling. And then of course, we have Artemisia Lomi Gentileschi. So immediately you were made to realize what a trailblazer she was, particularly as she was the first in the 17th century and in Florence, which was utterly male dominated, um, as you know, just after the high Renaissance. So who was this extraordinary talent who sprung from virtually nowhere? Well, this is a self portrait. Um, of Artemisia. She's painted herself as St. Catherine and she's, um, she's, she's, got, she's got a hand on the wheel, um, symbolic of the, of the fact that St. Catherine was martyred on a wheel. It's a strange, and I, a strange way she's done it really because she seems to, she's bro it's a broken wheel, so whether that's suggesting that she was broken on the wheel, I don't know. But Artemisia Lomi Gentileschi, to give her a full name, was born in Rome in 1593 and died around 1656. We're not sure exactly when she died. This 1616 painting, which measures, measures just over two foot square, has been newly acquired by the National Gallery and is the catalyst for their recent um, exhibition of her work, the first ever exhibition in the UK. And of course, as we all know, it, it's been deferred now until next year. Hopefully it'll be happening again next year, along with the, the Titian exhibition. Artemisia's father was the painter Orazio Gentileschi. Her mother died when she was 12. As the eldest child, she learned her craft in her father's workshop, outperforming her brothers. Working in the style of Caravaggio, she is now considered one of the most accomplished 17th century Italian artists. She was the first woman to become a member of the Accademia di Arte in Florence and eventually acquired an international reputation. She specialized in scenes involving female heroines from mythology and the Bible. And there may be a reason for that, which we will come on to later. Her earliest work, Susanna and the Elders, was painted when she was 17. This measures just over four foot by um, seven foot, just under seven foot. At the time, it was suspected by some that she was helped by her father. It's one of several paintings on the theme of Susanna, depicting the moment when she was sexually propositioned by two elders. The scene is taken from the Old Testament book of Daniel. Unusually, Artemisia's signature is on the rear of the painting, not on the front. In point of fact, she only signed 19 of her works and rarely included any landscape or background or still life. And this one is typical in that respect. The story of Susanna is simply that she'd gone into the garden to bathe and her sneaky servant, for some extraordinary reason, had allowed two elders into the garden to spy on her. The elders demanded sexual favours from Susanna, but she rebuffed them. As a consequence, the elders attempted to ruin her reputation until Daniel intervened to suggest the two elders be questioned separately. In this way, he's made aware of discrepancies in their version of events and their stories do not coincide, and so Susanna's name remains unblemished. Oh, no, I didn't do that. Um, I'm so tempted to let Ruth Griffiths in. I, I wonder if I shall lose the presentation if I do. I'm going to risk it. Yes, okay. <laughs> Got away with that. Got away with that. 
So let's, um, right, so let's just dwell on this painting for a moment. Um, she's just got one foot dipped into the water of the bath. It's, um, it's uh, presumably a, a very large um, bath, bath house that she, she's in. Uh, 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 her stance is rather over dramatic, theatrical, we might say, I suppose. In fact, the same, would, we could say the same of the, of the two elders who are, um, you know, obsequiously spying on it. We notice we got a nice triangle effect. There's a very straight line there with that chap there. Um, the flesh is beautifully painted and there's a little, little bit of cloth there just to hide her modesty, although I don't think we'd have seen much anyway from that point of view. Beautifully painted for a 17 year old, I would have thought, he says patronizingly, we can't paint anything. Right, we'll move on. So back to this portrait of uh, Artemisia herself. In 1611, her father, busy with a large commission, hired Agostino Tassi to tutor his daughter privately, coaching her particularly in perspective, we're told. At some stage, Tassi seduces Artemisia, but she continues to have sexual relations with him on the understanding they will be married. However, Tassie had other ideas, and when her father realized that he had no intention of marrying her, he brought rape charges against him on her behalf. Now, for, fortunately for us, the trial is well documented, and according to Florentine law at the time, if Tassie hadn't taken her virginity, the charges could not have been brought. So the case hung on whether she was a virgin at the time of her seduction. The curious thing is, rather than torture Tassie and risk permanent damage to his hands, he being considered the more valued painter of the two, it was Artemisia who was tortured with thumb screws in order to ascertain the truth of the matter. Anyway, at, at the final, at the end of the trial, Tassie, oh, I, I ought to mention that Tassie was also accused of misappropriating her Judith and Holofernes painting, which we will come to later. And during the trial, which lasted seven months, it transpired that Tassie, who obviously was a bit, bit of a dodgy character by all accounts, he planned to murder his own wife, had slept with his sister-in-law, and was and intended to steal some of Horatio's paintings. The upshot of it all was that he was found guilty and exiled from Rome, but he was back in a very short time and simply took Oh, took on his career as where he'd left it off, so basically got away with it. 17th century Florence, as I said earlier, was clearly a man's world. There's a recent stage play called It's True, It's True, It's True, performed by three women, based on the trial records, and if you can get a hold of it, I do recommend it. There are some parts of it on YouTube, but not the whole thing on YouTube. I'm not quite sure where I stumbled across it but if you can find it there's also a film artemisia uh, made in 1997 which depicts her beginnings as a professional artist and her relationship with tassie and the trial uh, it's a subtitled film the film has its own version of events and appears to exonerate tassie which may be fair or may be not according to our understanding of what constitutes rape However, it's hardly surprising if Artemisia thought herself harshly treated by men, and in that you could be forgiven for assuming a reason why she seemed to be driven to paint heroines getting the upper hand over men. Possibly a rather simplistic view, but it's borne out later on, and, and certainly the feminist group of the, the 1970s jumped on it. So there we have the that's the newly acquired painting with the national gallery um and that was as i said that was going to be the reason i suppose i gave them the idea to have the retrospective of uh, gentileski um in the national gallery and i booked my ticket and everything all to go go down there as many others would have done as well but it was not to be i hope you've got a fairly strong stomach this morning and you've breakfasted well because some of her paintings are uh, it's definitely shade on the violent side and none more so than this one. This is Judith slaying Holofernes 
Um, it measures about just over six foot by five foot. And curiously, to my way of thinking anyway, this is a subject of many works of art from the Renaissance to the 20th century. Now Klimt painted this twice, Caravaggio of course, Orazio father painted the scene of Holly Furness being beheaded by Judith, Cranach the Elder painted it, Cristofano Allori painted it, Giorgioni painted it twice, Veronese, Eisheimer, Botticelli and many more. For some extraordinary reason they, these artists found this a compelling subject. Um, might not be to our taste these days. The work depicts the Israelite widow Judith beheading the Assyrian general Holofernes after she adduced him and got, got him drunk. Judith had been able to gain access to him because of her des his desire for her. She does so in order to kill him because his army was about to attack her city of Bethulia. The seduction with ulterior motive brings to mind, of course, Samson and Delilah. The subject of this painting is taken from the apocryphal Old Testament book of Judith. And heavily influenced by Caravaggio, she paints the scene using chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro um, is that style of painting where light and dark are contrasted heavily. Um, Caravaggio famous for it, Rembrandt particularly. So you've got a very dark background and then a light source, an undetermined light source, lights, uh, focuses on what you want particularly emphasized. So in this case, um, it focuses the viewer's gaze on the action as Holofernes grabs the maid in his struggle to survive. Artemisia doesn't spare the viewer's gaze and neither did Caravaggio. She made a second version of this painting after moving to Florence, which I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you next. But in both these versions, to me, that doesn't, she doesn't seem to have the right way of holding the sword. If she's trying to sever this guy's head, I can't quite see how she's doing it that way. Uh, you might have your own opinions on that, but that's the <coughs> second painting, which isn't a great deal dissimilar. Notice this golden yellow um, cl um, clothing that uh, Judith is wearing because we're going to see that again and again. She's very fond of that colour. Um, at least we've got a bit of blood spurt in here, which is perhaps more realistic than in, than in this one. This looks like dried blood to me, uh, but it's the same bed. Uh, why she went on to paint a second version of it, I'm not sure, but she did. And I'm not too sure about Judith's expression on her face, really. She looks as though she's just carving the, the joint of meat for Sunday dinner to me. And she's concentrating there, but there's no horror of, uh, of the incident that I can see anyway. We'll move on. A month after Tasso, Tasso's trial, Tassi's trial, it was arranged for Artemisia to marry Pierre Antonio Stiatesi, forgive my Italian pronunciation, an artist from Florence and she moved to Florence to become a successful court painter enjoying the patronage of the de Medicis. At around 1613 before she moved to Florence she painted this painting The Virgin and Child which is now in the Palazzo Spada in, in Rome. This is uh, a much more calming painting I'm sure you'll agree we've still got the chiaroscuro oh I'm going to let this lady in because it didn't matter last time oh hang on hang on hang on hang on I shouldn't have done that but I think I've got away with it there we are um the co colors the colors are very vivid uh, but she hasn't gone to any any great um bother in painting the creases and folds as she as she does later on uh, it's almost uh, a suggestion of the impressionistic style there but of course she's well ahead of the of the impressionists um, and it's a very bright painting for her as well this painting <coughs> i should mention at this point that she had a daughter artemisia had a daughter called prudencia whom she also 
um, taught to paint, though she never achieved Artemisia's fame, or probably, we'd probably say by the same token, never achieved her talent either. This painting is called Allegory of Inclination. It was commissioned by Michelangelo the Younger as one of a series of paintings by various artists to glorify the life of his famous great uncle, Michelangelo Buonarroti. And it's on the ceiling of the Galleria in the Casa Buonarroti in Florence. The nude figure, possibly a self-portrait, and I wouldn't like to say, I mean, many of these paintings are self-portraits. Yes, it could well. There is, there is a likeness there, I think. <clears throat> uh, she's holding a mariner's compass and is guided by a star. So when it's called the allegory of inclination, I think we have to think in terms of angles of inclination. <clears throat> anyway, the nudity, it, she was painted completely nude by Artemisia and it was considered a bit too much for some members of the Buonarroti family, despite the fact that uh, Michelangelo painted nudes. The so what was what was, what they did or got somebody to do was to paint this um, this cloak this cloak or covering or whatever it is and this diaphanous bit of muslin here uh, and you can tell straight away that this isn't Artemisia's work because it's rather crude slapdash it's, it's very quick brush strokes there look at this area for instance. Um, so it's been done in a in a big hurry, I think, by somebody uh, in a later at a later time. Nudity was considered a bit too much for the and uh, the, the the members of the family. Um, oh, I said that I'm not here. Right, okay. We'll move on. We'll move on. Letters which came to light as recently as 2011 suggest Artemisia had a passionate love affair with a rich Florentine nobleman between 1616 and 1620. Astonishingly, her husband appears to have condoned it since he corresponded with her lover on the back of Artemisia's love letters, if you can believe that. He presumably tolerated the affair because her lover, Marigny, could provide them with financial support. However, by 1620, rumors of the liaison combined with debts chased her back to Rome but without her husband. She was famous now, and her father describes in the letter how her house was full of cardinals and princes. Works from her Florentine period, including this one, the conversion of Mary Magdalene, which is in the Peter, uh, the Peter Palace in Florence. This measures about six foot by four foot. And there we have uh, a very good instance of that that golden yellow colour, that lovely plush dress that she's wearing. And, um, in fact, this is this is a particularly well painted um, painting, I would say. And she signed it here. She signed herself Artemisia Lomi, uh, rather than Gentileschi. Well, she's saving on paint there, isn't she? Because Lomi is a much shorter word. I like. I'm also drawn to the back of this. Um, chair that she's sitting in because I don't know whether you can notice it but just here it looks as though it's slightly frayed she's gone to the trouble of fr making it slightly frayed as though it's been around and these edges as well as though it's been around a while and of course she's got a she's got a hand over her heart and she's got that beatific look on her face I won't do that right Another self-portrait, and you, you soon come to recognize Artemisia, what she looks like. This is a, a self-portrait as a lute player. This painting is in the USA at the moment and measures just under three foot by two foot. Uh, she's gone to a lot of trouble with the fingers on the frets. And I think they're particularly convincing. And I love this little bit of detail on her, on her dress. Um, it, it's very subtle, very subtly drawn, um, painted, uh, sort of arabesque um, ribbon effect. And the, the headwear that she wears as well, that's, that, we see that again and again. I'm not quite sure. I, I imagine it's a bit, bit like a shawl or scarf or something, the way she's 
she's knotted it so that it swings around there and then it goes down the back as well so um i'd be interested to know how that how, what that how it actually put it on her head to start with <clears throat> now we are back to judith and the maid sir but not quite so bloody as the actual beheading but this is this is definitely not a um um self-portrait judith there they're both looking they're both looking to the right something has caught their attention poor old holly furnace is fast asleep in the basket here as you can see and judith has shouldered her fine looking sword with that very elaborately ornate uh, pommel she, um, on the end of it there so we've got to imagine what what it is that's caught their attention and why they're looking so um concerned about it uh it, 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 uh, it surprises me why why artists choose this sort of stance because there's no explanation for it there seems to be no real reason why why she's doing it but she's got the head in profile here of course and as you can see again caravaggio's uh chiaroscuro uh, is very much is uh, is very much in evidence despite her artistic reputation rome had not been as profitable as she had hoped her style and subject matter had now become less intense and as you can see from this second version of susanna and the elders um which is in burley house in stamford i don't know how it, how it ended up there but it, uh, it makes a change for it to be in this country not in america um you can see that the, well I, i'll show you the, the that's that's the original one which i think is a far finer painting it's far better executed in my opinion i'll go back to that one again so you can see them both again we've got these sort of theatrical um sort of ham acting going on by susanna there and the two letches they, they look they look creeps we've got we've, we've got a sort of silhouette there of a huge huge sort of bowl i don't quite know what it is and a little bit of cloud and then and even a tree which is very rare for artemisia to paint and we got more in this in this instance we've got much more of the water um and she's she, she uh, her feet have disappeared into the water um so something decided her to paint this painting again but in a slightly different style but i i i i prefer this one myself i don't know what you think about it now then this fine gentleman is a gonfalonieri and from this time on she concentrated on portraits and biblical heroines and received no commissions for altar pieces between 1627 and 1630 she moved to venice perhaps in search of richer pickings although it's difficult to date some of her paintings a venetian period certainly produced this one now a gonfalonieri is a is a sort of highly highly prestigious um office um something like a senator or a councillor i suppose or a lawmaker um, he's quite a striking character and he's, he appears to have black armor well he has got black armor on and he's got this very elaborate neck ruff i'm not sure i would buy a second hand car off him there's something a little bit of the ice cream seller about him but that's me being prejudiced i suppose i like this flag or banner i suppose it is I and mean, when she only shows us a small amount of a small part of that and the big tassel of course and of course the reds complement each other so this this could be from his hat these plumes here could be from it from his hat and uh, i'm not quite sure what that is um so we don't know his name and we are back yet again to judith and her maidservant this is painted in 1624 this is in america this measures six foot by um five foot six and again the same subject of the slaying of holly furnace or this time we 
the Holy Furnace uh, uh, as is already dead and his head is in the basket. One might be forgiven for thinking that this subject has become an obsession. The painting captures a moment when Judith's maid, Abra, wraps the severed head in a bag while Judith keeps watch. And this time they're both looking to the left. In the previous one, they were both looking to the right. They're both looking to the left. And I think this is a self-portrait, actually. I'm, I, I'm not quite sure. We've got a little bit of still life here. It's only shown, it's basically delineated by the, the way the light catches the metal. It's a candle, isn't it? And she almost looks as though she's about to burn her hand on the candle. Um, though obviously, it, it's quite a way away from it. This is one of her most admired paintings and, and uh, is considered to be to, to ex uh, express her mastery of chiaroscuro. Notice this drape here cu cutting off the top left hand corner. She uses this device as you'll see again and again. She, she, likes, she likes that left hand corner to be covered like that. I don't know why. And again we've got this golden yellow um, dress. I mean, it might be the same dress that she's using all the time as a prop. Uh, we don't know. It could well be. Um, although she's famous by now, so she should be able to afford um, uh, um, plenty, uh, props and clothes, etc. Now, this is a this is not one of Artemisia's self portraits. This is a portrait of Artemisia, painted in 1626 by a French. Um, artist called Vouet, Simon Vouet. Um, I don't think it's a very good portrait. I don't think it's anything like as good as her own self-portraits myself, but it's interesting to see how another artist has tried to capture her. Um, it's, uh, the paint, the, fa the face to me is almost chiseled. Um, it's sculpted somehow. It's not, it hasn't got the smooth lines that she produces in her own paintings and i'm curious to see her colors uh, the colors on her palette as well i can't see any greens there for argument's sake not that that matters but um they're quite somber colors she's got there and her paintbrushes are all very small they're very small paintbrushes indeed and i'm not quite sure what she's got in her hand here it doesn't look like a paintbrush to me it may be some sort of device for etching or um, it looks quite a sharp point at that point. Anyway, we'll move on from Simon Fouet's uh, likeness. Also, it's claimed from her Venetian period are this one, the penitent Magdalene, or uh, she, I, I, she doesn't look pe particularly penitent to me. I don't know what you think. She looks just tired, basically. She's having a, she's having a nap. This painting's in Seville at the moment beautifully painted the clothes and the uh and the, and the uh, hair and the skin and again we've got this drape as i just mentioned across the left hand corner and the, and again the chiaroscuro so there's definitely her technique now you would you'll be starting to recognize her technique even if you weren't familiar with it before ah I don't know whether you can see all this painting. I don't mind the um, everybody's images are, 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 are anyway. There we are. This is a sleeping. This is a sleeping Venus or Venus and Cupid painted in 1626. It measures just under six foot by three foot tall. Yet another painting that's found its way uh, into the USA. Cupid is fanning her with peacock feathers as she drifts to sleep. In the background, we're told there is a window looking out onto a moonlit landscape where a temple to the goddess lies. Now, I don't know. I'm taking. I would take some convincing that this is a window. It looks more like it looks more like the frame of a painting to me. But anyway, the experts tell us it is a window. This could actually be the top of the of a balustrade, and there are the pillars of the balustrade. So maybe maybe it is anyway. Um, so um, I don't know whether you, you see see her head. Maybe is it, is, it, is it cut off? Yes, maybe. maybe yeah. So 
You can just use the uh, pointer to pull the pictures to the right. Can I? Let me have a look. No, no we've done it. You, you have to, you have oh, to you've do done it. it, you mean? Yeah, you have to do it yourself individually. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, it just cuts off the top of her head, really, but you can still see the be beautifully painted flesh tones. And uh, Eli, um, Cupid has got, um, I don't know what sort of expression she's giving him, but he looks, he's got a bit of devilment in him to me. And 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 just may I just, and there's the drape again, the, the red drape and the, on the on the on the left hand corner for some extraordinary reason. This painting now is generally uh, <coughs> is um, a painting of Esther and Ahasuerus. It's difficult to pronounce. I'd rather pronounce his call him by his other name, which is Xerxes, and which we are, we are more familiar with. But the painting is actually called Esther and Asasurus, painted in 1626. Uh, it's a huge canvas, unusually large for Artemisia. It measures 82 inches by 108. That's nine foot. That's nine foot uh, long. Um, and it depicts the Jewish heroine Esther. Again, we've got another biblical heroine. Who appeared before her husband, King um, Ahasuerus, aka Xerxes, in order to stave off a massacre of Jewish people, breaking with court protocol and thereby risking death, apparently. Esther faints before the king had chance to grant her request. Notice how she's painted them in contemporary dress, hasn't attempted to capture um, uh, the, the dress of the of the um, times which was perfectly acceptable i suppose in those days um an african page restraining a dog was painted out by the artist but it's partly visible beneath the marble pavement to the left of the king's knee so it's some he's somewhere <coughs> there i don't know whether oh sorry didn't mean to do that i don't know whether you can see i can see but I'm right, right up close to it. I can just see some sort of outline. You can't really how big it is. We don't. I don't know. But you can just see that something has been painted over there. So for some reason, she decided she didn't want him in, um, and so she painted him out. I'm not familiar with the story of Esther, to be perfectly honest. But again, we get the we get it's the same it's the same theme again, and we shall see it again as well as the 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 um, the um, victimization of women by by men. In 1630, Artemisia moved to Naples, where she complains in the letter of the chaos, hard living, and high cost of everything. Nonetheless, she remained in Naples for the remainder of her career. And with the exceptions of one or two brief trips, which included London, that's where she stayed. Her Neapolitan debut is represented by the Annunciation. This was painted in 1636. Another huge painting, six foot, um, well, eight foot by six foot, at least. Uh, this painting is in Naples at the moment. She also started work there on the paintings in the cathedral at Pozzioli, where she painted the birth of St. John the Baptist. Another large painting. This is in the Prado in Madrid. Apart from Zacharias, um, it's not clear who the other adults are. There's no evidence of Elizabeth there, but she's just, presumably, she's just given birth. So it's assumed that these characters here, which make this sort of classic triangle of people, uh, are, are midwives or neighbours who've just popped in. This clearly is uh, Zacharias here, what he's doing, uh, making his will maybe, I don't know, he's writing something there anyway. Artemisia signed it on this crumpled bit of paper um, down there. That's a, she just signed Artemisia on there, I think. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the layout of this building that she's put them in, because this seems here, with this archway we've got, she seems to be on a different plane somehow. So you'd have to, from the floor down here, you'd have to get up 
you'd have to mount several steps to get up there and then you get outside onto this balcony effect it all looks a little bit um uh painted with second thoughts and we better put something there and, and at least we haven't got the drape there this time um yeah right now then this one is is called corsica and the satyr painted in 1633 another large painting seven foot by six foot or five foot uh, and this is in Naples. it's a nymph is running away from a satyr the satyr attempts to grab the nymph by her hair but the hair is in fact a wig artemisia happy to suggest the nymph is too clever for the aggressive attack of the satyr and the satyrs of course are well known for their sexual um, <clears throat> pro, pro, um what shall i say um, preference and um, so uh, have we have we got a symbolic tassie here i don't know has she got tassie in mind with this one getting one over on tassie maybe she has maybe she hasn't some of the paintings in this period were collaborations collaborations uh, bathsheba for instance this one is painted in 13 in 1636 uh, and this also has found its way to um america but it's all there are we know for a fact there are also contributions by painters called Cadazzi and cariolo um and i suspect that they contributed this background um building here uh, and that little figure there i s may well be david of course david um spies on her doesn't in the biblical story he spies on Bathsheba Sheba, and then arranges for her, her husband to leave the planet rather quickly um, so I my guess is that they contributed that and the Artemisia painted the figures um, this silver bowl here is brilliantly painted how it's you know, to paint silver without using silver paint which, which which presumably she didn't have is very very difficult believe you me but that looks highly polished silver to me and she's basically just just painted it in black and white i would say with perhaps a hint of blue um i think that is quite extraordinary and again we have the influence of Car Carascoro. There's, there's a, the light is coming in from the left and catching Bathsheba there so putting her in complete um, focus and just catching the back of this maid's um, figure there and again we've got this golden yellow this chrome yellow dress that she's so fond of painting In 1638, Artemisia joined her father in London at the court of Charles I, where Horatio was decorating the Queen's house at Greenwich, a ceiling allegory of triumph of peace and the arts. Charles I, an enthusiastic collector of paintings, as we know, had invited her to his court. He already owned this painting, called a self-portrait as the allegory of painting, and this, of course, is is now in the royal collection because most of Charles's um, paintings that he collected, he's a, a big collector of paintings, uh, and they form the basis of the uh, royal the um, royal collection. <coughs> and this is there. Artemisia paints herself as a symbolic embodiment of art, as a professional artist combining allegory with self-portrait, and and. It, it, there's no the, the the canvas is suggested on the extreme left she's just about to paint something on it although in actual fact it, I, i'm yes I, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be angled at that point is she she must be facing it straight on i would think it's a curious pose for her really one feels as though there ought to, ought to be a bit more body just down there somehow but um uh, she's got away with it i suspect um, and, and again, we've got the palette there and the very small paint brushes, which of course she's painted this herself rather than Simon Vouet, who painted the other one. This is a very famous painting, as I said, of um, 
of Artemisia's uh, well known. It's a it's a curious attitude. She, she's painted her in a very curious stance. And there's lovely greens here. She, we don't find too many greens uh, used by Artemisia, but there's a lovely subtle green here. I'm not quite sure what color we'd call that green, but it's picked out again uh, on only a much darker uh, version of it further down the sleeve because it, that's gone and gone into the shadow as it were. And then, and then blues as well, but, uh, just under the palette there. So, um, and, and the, also the green complements the brown of the shoulder there. So I think that's a very, very beautiful painting and it's subtly, subtly done as far as the tones uh, of the color. As opposed to this one, which is um, not one of my favorites, David and the head of Goliath. We've got yet another severed, severed head, but instead of Holofernes, this is Goliath's head. That's a huge sword David is leaning on. So I'm guessing that's Goliath's sword. He's got a rather, she's given him a rather supercilious expression on his face, which I don't care for um, personally, but there we are. Um, you make you have to make your own minds up whether you, you like that. There's a lot of detail in the folds and uh, and creases of the of, of, his, of his, his chemise or shirt, whatever you like to call it, and uh, and the and the rest of his clothing. This probably dates from the London period as well. Now, in 1639, her father, Arazio, died suddenly, and Artemisia had already left England by 1642 when the English Civil War broke out. Nothing much is known about her subsequent movements except that we know she returned to Naples. One of her last known paintings is a virgin and child with rosary. This is quite a small painting, actually. It only measures 24 inches by 15 inches across. This is in Spain at the moment. It's painted uh, in oils but on copper. Um, and there's been some debate as to whether the painting is actually by Artemisia, mainly because of their choice of uh, colours. But despite that, um, she signed it. So I think we've got to assume it is by her. Again, we've got the drape, although it's not red this time, it's green, but we've got it going from left to right across that corner and certainly this is a very striking red um, that she's painted and and uh, and she's not not spent too much time over the creases and uh, and, uh, uh, and and pleats and that although i suppose the this very light muslin or lace um scarf is 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 well painted um, they've got the roses on the right there and the baby the infant seems to have roses in his hand as well and he's and he's stretching out towards this jewel or this necklace that she's teasing him with back to Bathsheba again this is another late work and this is in Berlin at the moment um, uh, painted in 1850 the, the Old Testament story which I'm, I'm sure many of you will will know relates to how King David was walking on the roof of his house from where he could see into the courtyard of one of his bravest warriors Uriah the Hittite immediately he's captivated by the sight of Bathsheba bathing say so again we don't see we've got the buildings there uh, uh, in that uh, top corner but we don't see any evidence of David himself she's simply um, surrounded by her maids and, and again, lovely silverware here. Uh, perhaps not silver, maybe copper. I don't know. But she's very, she's a very fine painter of metal. It's a wonder she doesn't hadn't painted more of it, really. But um, so there we are. It's um, yeah. It's interesting that on many of her canvases we see nude females, but the men are always dressed. This is probably because the church categorically forbade women to paint nude males. 
in this later painting, Artemisia's style is less Caravanesque, maybe, or more refined, although I would say it's pretty Caravanesque. The dramatic contrasts have largely been abandoned for a style which was later called Mannerist. It is a classic, it is a classic pose, I suppose. Um, it's likely the urban landscape was painted by another artist that we don't know. Now we're back to the horror pictures again. Over 90% of Artemisia's painting feature women as protagonists or the equal of men, as in this one, this is of Jael and Cesare. I'm not familiar with the story of Jael and Cesare. It depicts a moment in which Jael is about to murder Cesare, a defeated Canaanite general, a favorite scenario of hers. After his defeat, he flees to a nearby settlement where Jael, I suppose you pronounce it Jael, that's J-A-E-L, -E I'm pronouncing it Jael anyway, um, takes him in, promises to hide him from the authorities, but the moment he, he is asleep, she drives a tent peg through his temple. So we're spared the blood in this one anyway, I suppose there's, we've got to be thankful for small mercies. Um, but again, we've got a, a, a heroic fe female getting one over on the male um, species. This one is quite obviously Cleopatra, and we know that because she's got a snake in her hand. Um, this is this paint has found its way into Milan. I think this is almost certainly a, a, a self-portrait as well. So Artemisia is quite happy to show as her new body um, and I think there's a um, would I be ungracious in saying that um, she's certainly looking very well and then this is another one of Cleopatra um, not, definitely not a self-portrait this time and just about to see a snake in the in the hand in the hand there um, this is the only reproduction of it I could find in Google Images, to be perfectly honest, it's not a particularly flattering um, painting, I don't think. And uh, again, we, uh, I mean, uh, that gaze of her, of uh, Cleopatra, uh, reminds me of Susanna and the Elders. It's, a, I think, it might be the same model actually, uh, although there's a lot of years apart, and it can't be the same model unless she had it, the model in her mind the, with her features. But anyway, it's the same sort of theatrical gaze on uh, on her face. Um, I would say. And then this one, this is definitely a self-portrait. This is of Lucretia. Um, and this, this painting is in Germany. <clears throat> Lucretia was the wife of a Roman general, Tarquinius, at the moment of her suicide, brought about because she was raped. Ha, ha, ha. Echoes again there. And then black, blackmailed by one of the soldiers. Yet again, the subject is a virtuous woman ill-treated by a man. Because Artemisia returned again and again to violent subject matters, such as Judith on Holofernes, Gile and Cesare, it's hardly surprising that a repressed, repressed vengeance theory had been postulated by some. It has also been suggested that she shrewdly took advantage of her fame from the rape trial to cater for a niche market in sexually charged female dominant art for the dubious appreciation of male patrons and i leave that thought with you she wrote we know nothing of artemisia's death in a letter written towards the end of her life she wrote with me you will find the spirit of caesar in the soul of a woman she was certainly in Naples in 1650 because a letter dates from that year. And some have speculated that she died in the plague that swept Naples in 1656. Apparently this plague virtually wiped, plague virtually wiped out an entire generation of Neapolitan artists. And it may well be she was one of them. We do know she was buried in the church of St. John of the Florentines in Naples. But it was destroyed in the Second World War, so there's there's no way of um, visiting the the grave or the tomb or whatever she was given at the time. This one, this painting is uh, Mary Magdalene in ecstasy. That's what it's called, the Mary Magdalene in ecstasy. It measures about six foot. This is quite quite unusual. There's not much evidence of chiaroscuro in that. In fact, it's the back the the um, the landscape here is is quite 
atypical of Artemisia, I think. So whether that's been painted in by someone else, I don't know. But the skin tones, the flesh tones, are certainly um, Artemisias. And this, this again, this, this, this um, blessed look on her face um, on the, on, uh, is, is typical. We've seen that again and again. Uh, her, her models, whether they're herself or, or other people, they all look remarkably well to me. This one is St. Sebastian, tended by Irene and Lucina. I Don't ask me which one is Irene and which one is Lucina, I have no idea. It was painted in 1630. And this is an interesting painting because it, it up until 2014, which was only six years ago, it was attributed to the school of Artemisia and it came up on the, it came on the market at Bonhams in 2014 and sold for 40,000 pounds. Within the last 12 months it's been reattributed by scholars to Artemisia herself and that reattribution um, has given it a ticket of half a million pounds. In fact it sold its other biz this year for half a million pounds. So it's all in the name. I'm a bit worried about this flame. And she again, she likes to put. She puts her hands close to flames in some of her paintings. Um, and this is a very dark painting, of course. But this was right in the middle of her chiaroscuro um, period, as it were. So um, we got we got the sort of theatrical looks on their faces again. It's very typical of Renaissance paintings, anyway. And poor old sense. Uh, I think so. I don't know whether he's dead or he's dying. He looks. He doesn't look very well. Anyway, <clears throat> this one is um, of Saint Cecilia playing the lute, painted in 1620. And again, we've got this same colour again. This this yellow, this golden yellow um, dress. So it's not always the same style dress, and with the white sleeves. But uh, she certainly is very very fond of this colouring, and she's good with. She's good with the fingers. We saw it on the lute when she on the other uh, portrait of herself playing the lute. She's um, she's it, hands are notoriously difficult to paint, but I think there's a she's made a good stab at that anyway. And this is a final self portrait and the last painting I'm going to leave you with, painted in 1637. There's definitely a challenging look on her face. And the actual painting is in poor condition. I mean, this is a canvas that she's, this, this guy isn't standing by her, he's paint, she's painting him. Um, and some have speculated that this is, this painting is actually done by Simon Vouet. Um, because it, the, the portrait, it's very similar to the portrait uh, he painted, however, very similar indeed, and I can see that as well. But um, general opinion is that um, she did paint it. Just talk a little bit before I finish about her legacy. The feminine interest in Artemisia Gentileschi dates from the 1970s, as I've already mentioned, when the feminist art historian Linda Nocklin published an article entitled, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? The first writer who produced a novel around the figure of Artemisia may have been George Eliot in her novel, Romola in 1863. This was set in, Lauren, in Florence in Gentileschi's time, where some aspects of the story are recognizable but greatly embroidered. The, uh, I don't recommend the novel. It's I've read. I think I've read all George Eliot's novels, and that's my 